Hello everyone, and welcome to a new multi-part series that I'm going to be doing all about uh, designing and running Vampire the Masquerade. Or at least how I like to run my games. Uh, so, quick, just a couple of things I want to get out of the way. First of all, I don't really run Vampire the Masquerade. Like, it's a horror game. Obviously, there's that sort of angst. You get from, like, touchstones and convictions and the beast. But uh, I like to focus a lot more on sort of the politics, the power struggles, the factions, all that fun stuff. Uh, so that's what I like to run, and that's what I feel like I'm good at running. So that's what you're going to get in this series of tutorials. Uh, the other big thing is I want to give a shout-out to uh, one of the big inspirations, uh, something that has really influenced how I run Vampire the Masquerade. It's a little game called Undying. Uh, it's a kind of obscure tabletop RPG. It's also about, you know, vampires living in the real world, it focuses a lot on like power struggles and factions and status, and it has a lot of handy tools for like uh, setting up your game, running it, keeping the conflict going, that sort of thing. So it's been a huge help uh, for me, and I'm hoping it'll be huge help for you. I'll put a link in the description and in the sidebar, because the people who make that game really deserve a lot more love. So the first step, I feel, in any good Vampire the Masquerade campaign is uh, the community and the city, uh, which is what we're going to be focusing on in this video. Step one, choose where you want to set the campaign. That includes, like, the physical location, obviously, but also what time period. Like, right now, uh, I have a friend who's running Vampire the Masquerade. Their game takes place in, like, 1960s, 1970s Bucharest, because uh, that was a point with increased, like, government surveillance, which makes it a lot harder to uphold the Masquerade, which is fun. Uh, as you can see in the top right corner, I'm running a game set in Colorado. Uh, and kind of the, kind of the backstory I have in my head is that when Westward Expansion happened, uh, a bunch of, a bunch of vampires basically, mostly Vontru, looking for new business opportunities, and Gangrel, who just like to travel naturally, he helped build up a bunch of, like, boom towns. But when those wells, metaphorically and literally, dried up, uh, they were kind of stuck there. Because, uh, kind of tiny baby problem, uh, the Wild West had a lot of werewolves, apparently, if you read into the source books. So they were basically stuck in this ghost town and had to build a community from it, which I think is super interesting. Uh, it's going to be set in the state of Colorado, but uh, I actually want to come up with uh, my own uh, name for this ghost town. And by that I mean uh, I'm using fantasynamegenerator.com, which is another handy resource. Again, links in the description. Marrow Ridge. Alright, so it's set in the fictional ghost town of Marrow Ridge. Uh, so you have the location. Uh, next, you want to decide uh, who's in power, or who's vying for power. Uh, obviously, by default, you have the Camarilla, the Anarchs, uh, like Independents, uh, or Sabbat. Uh, I generally like to do Camarilla games. I don't think I've actually run an Anarch game. I've played in Anarch and Independent games, but I've never run one. Uh... But, yeah, basically kind of think about what sort of game you want. Camarilla is uh, kind of like a mafia game, honestly. Uh, Anarch and Independent are probably going to focus more on, like, like street thugs, like that, those kind of gangs. While the Sabat game most likely have a lot of similarities to cults. So think a lot about what kind of game you run and what sort of... Uh, faction is uh, going to be in charge. For this, I like the idea that it was started as a Camarilla city, but since, like, none of the higher-ups, like the Archons or Justicars, could reach the city, it was eventually overthrown and became an Anarch 
domain. So we're going to be doing, we're going to actually be designing an Anarch game, which is super fun. Uh, and lastly, you want to finally get to the fun part, which is designing your characters. Now, uh, what I like to do, and again, this is where Undying comes in super handy. Uh, you want to create sort of a relationship map, which is actually something they recently did in Vampire 5th Edition. Uh, what you want to do is you want to start with a core conflict. You want to start with two vampires who don't like each other. Uh... So let's, oh yeah, by the way, uh, for what I do to create the relationship maps, you could do it in like Vol20 or on a sheet of paper. Uh, I like to use, uh, go to, in Google Docs, which is where I do most of my planning, I go to insert, drawing, new. And you have the little boxes. Yeah, boxes. Yeah, arrows. All that fun stuff. So, uh... You want to start with two people who just kind of don't like each other. Uh, since it's a conflict that's going to very much affect the city, odds are they're going to be people of, uh, if not, like, they're going to be important. Like, the, <laughs> I mean, it might be fun, but the city's probably not going to be shaped by a conflict between two, like, people who have been vampires for 12 years. So... Yeah, uh, I'm gonna do some kind of boring placeholder names. The Baron. Let's say he's Gangrel, because I feel like Gangrel kind of have what it takes to survive out in uh, the desert, basically. We have a Gangrel Baron of the Anarchs. Uh, and his rival. Let's say a businessman. Normally I put actual names. Oops. Businessman, <laughs> Von True. There we go. So they don't like each other. Why? Uh, that's the first question you want to ask yourself. Why don't they like each other? Uh, the uh, Undying, again, has some recommendations. Uh, maybe uh, they have a grudge against each other. Uh, maybe one is like, you know, it's just business. I just... Want more power, and you're in my way. Or maybe it has something to do uh, with an external threat to the community, uh, in which case uh, one of these two is actively, or maybe more out of ignorance, or maybe like consciously making things worse. Uh, I think that our businessman... Uh, you know what? Let's give him... Actual names, hold on. Alright, so our Vondry businessman is named Evan Ross, and our Gangrel, uh, Baron is Daisy Lloyd. This is very old worst names. Uh, so I like the idea that, uh, I like the idea that at this point, because Westward expansion happened, and there's more cities out in the West that uh, Ross is trying to establish connections with the Camarilla. But Daisy Lloyd doesn't like that. She likes the Anarchs being in power. So draw a line right there, and with a text box, put grudge. Uh, you could also put uh, the reason in parentheses, undermining her. Power. Undermining her power. If it wants to move. There we go. So, he... She doesn't like him because he's undermining her power. Next, you want to establish who has the upper hand, who has the more most resources. Who, who's winning, basically. I like the idea that... The Baron's in power, because people are like, you know, we've lived this way for nearly 200 years at this point. We're not going to stop now. So Lloyd is the one in power. Uh, next, we need to decide why. What is, what's her greatest resource? What does she have 
that Mr. Evan Ross doesn't. And like I just said, she has the support of the people. So if we uh, back out of here, let's center that. I like things that look good in my notes. So if we drop down, uh, Daisy Lloyd, Baron of Merovinge, put her clan right there. Uh, her strengths, public opinion. People like her. Or, uh, maybe more accurately, people like being anarchs, and she's the one that supports that. So, uh, but what does Ross have? Evan Ross, camera loyalist, Vontrio. Uh, what does he have? Uh, I like to think he has business acumen. He's good at, uh, uh, getting deals for the city, making sure that even though they're kind of in the middle of BFE, Colorado, uh, they don't want for, like, supplies. Uh, maybe he, ooh, maybe he's, like, maybe he runs, like, a tourist company or something. So people come there, they get fed upon, and then they leave. So there's no, like, suspicion brought down upon the city. Next step, or at least what Undying recommends, is somehow integrating the, whoever rules the city into this. Uh, obviously, we have the Baron, who's already in charge. Uh, but I do always like to introduce a sort of third party into things. Uh, so let's say uh, the third party is going to be uh, almost always involved in things, not because they want to be, but because they owe one of the parties uh, something. What exactly is that? That's where the fun part is. So let's say that the person involved in this, I don't know why their balloon is so much bigger. Let me just copy and paste this. Let's say that the person involved in all this shenaniganery, let's just uh, say Smuggler Nosferatu. I'll come up with a real name in a second. Let's say he's working for Ross uh, because of a, a major boon. So put M-A-J. Or just Major Boon, whatever you want to put. And draw that line. And boom! So there you have a good part of the central conflict. You have uh, Evan Ross, who's trying to establish connections with the Camarilla. Uh, and has the know-how to do so. Daisy Lloyd, who wants things to stay as they are. And has the uh, opinion of the people. And this poor uh, Nosferatu smuggler, who I shall now give a true name. Liam Murray, and you have this poor guy caught up in the middle of it because he owes a debt to Mr. Ross. Why is that? Why does he uh, owe him a debt? Why is why is Ross so loyal to the Camarilla? Because it's not like a built-in Vanchu thing as much as they might want you to think. So why? There's a lot of things here that are like, why? And that's interesting. You want to ask yourself... Those questions, every line, every connection, uh, even like, okay, so why does Ross want to connect to the Camarilla? Uh, how did Lloyd become the Baron of Merovich? How did she get that public opinion? Uh, what are some ways that Ross could combat her? Well, then you would add uh, her weaknesses. Like, maybe, maybe Lloyd's not like actually that good of a politician because she's a gangle she's she's in charge because like she knows how to survive but she's bad at the actual politics and that's where he can hit her and uh he's bad uh, it's kind of a good idea to basically have them balance each other out because you don't really want to know who's going to win your players are going to be the tipping point, basically. So he's uh, unlikable. So no one likes Ross. Uh, Murray certainly doesn't. And from there, you're just going to go through the relationship map, add a couple more vampires, uh, maybe establish a couple of minor spats. Uh, but you can do that on your own time. So this is where we get uh, our core conflict from. Uh, and... 
from there we can start designing like the factions because right now this is just about two people who don't like each other well that's what we're going to expand upon uh over in another document all right so over on the second page we are going to be working on fleshing out uh, the factions uh first of all we obviously have the anarchs uh, and then we have the loyalists who want to defect to the camarilla uh so each faction i like to expand on like four or five different things first of all what do they believe in so you have their beliefs what drives them what common goal do they unite behind next you have members you want to cover uh at least three different members in this and we'll get to that in a bit we're gonna do deep dives into these i just want to go over the uh broad strokes right now so beliefs members you have their mo or modus operandi which is how they actually go about accomplishing their goals uh another fun one that isn't necessarily it isn't necessary but i like to have it is schisms any sort of rifts between these factions uh and lastly motifs Motifs are mostly a storytelling tool, so, like, if the uh, Anarchs attack, I'm like, oh, this color is associated with them, so figure this color prominently into the scene. That sort of thing. So, and we'll just copy and paste those onto the Loyalists. All right, so beliefs. Why do they work together? What do they believe in? Well, uh, obviously, these Anarchs believe in, since they were... Since they were founded by sort of uh, the westward expansion and go west, young man, and those sorts of beliefs. They believe in change and always striving for something more that, you know, right now, it can always be better. Don't focus on the right now, focus on uh, the future. Because the future is always better than what we have right now, which is kind of the idea behind westward expansion. Uh, and never get complacent. Uh, members, obviously we have their leader, uh, Daisy Lloyd. Uh, she's the Baron of Merovinge. Uh, we'll expand on her in a bit. So what I like to do is I like to have two types of members that I believe are essential. So first of all, you want to design the uh, face, uh, sort of, when someone looks at that faction, or when the public thinks about that faction or looks at them, who do they see? Uh, then you have the leader, who's actually in charge, because in Vampire the Masquerade, they're rarely the same person. Uh, sometimes your face and your leader might be the same person, but they don't need to be. Uh, and... Lastly, you just want a third person to kind of flesh them out. So, I think uh, Daisy Lloyd, obviously, since people like her, she's the face of the movement. Uh, let's say she has, uh, ooh, maybe she has, like, an, a, a Torridor assistant. So, we have Elias Park, Lloyd's enforcer, and most trusted advisor maybe he's making a ooh, maybe he he might be making a play for power who knows and lastly let's actually add i already forgot his name the smuggler guy uh liam murray let's make liam murray a member of the annex yeah murray a smuggler cool uh so we have lloyd who's kind of the public face of things who's very bad at politics we have Elias, who's like, don't worry, fam, I got you. Uh, maybe he's quietly seizing power. And we have Liam, who's happy to be there. So how do they uh, operate? How do they... How do they work? Because, basically, how do they spread their beliefs? How do they uh, fight back when people come to take their power? And how do they make sure that they have power? Uh, so... I like to think that, uh, I like the idea that there's propaganda, like, a lot of propaganda. Oh, maybe this is like, I like the idea that this is like a hard right, 
like like all I don't know how what political leaning Colorado is, but I like the idea that these anarchs are very much like hard right like uh someone's always out to get you, so atmosphere of paranoia. I like to keep people paranoid because that keeps people changing. Uh, atmosphere of paranoia. Uh, let's say us versus them. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, the atmosphere of paranoia is probably the greatest tool in their arsenal, but reminders of the good old days. Uh, you can come up with as many tools of these as you want, uh, but it's all how they, uh, Basically, how do they fight for their beliefs? Uh, schisms? Uh, hmm. What would this be? Let's say Elias Park feels underappreciated. Oh, it's basically the time when Lannister, I just realized. Uh, except no one like Ares. People like Lloyd, it seems. So Elias feels underappreciated. Uh, what if people are... People aren't buying the prop. Propaganda. So people are like, you've been telling us for over 200 years that a war is coming and it never has. What's going on, Daisy? Uh, stuff like that. So you have a right hand man who feels very unappreciated and the only reliable tool they have in their arsenal is kind of dying out. Uh, kind of. It's a schism and obviously she still has the majority of public opinion. But there are people who like... I don't think that war is ever going to come. Oh, maybe she's like a Gehenna prophet or something. Oh, that'd be very interesting. Uh, motifs. Oh, yeah. Let's actually put that actually. Signs of Gehenna. Oh, so this is a city where, like, they don't like thin bloods. Because she's like, see, that I know I've been saying it for, like, 200 years. But look, finally, the enemy that I've warned you all about has arrived. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, and motifs, these are just symbols. Uh, gold. Uh, because of the gold rush. Uh, traditional American iconography. Guns. Pew, pew, pew. Uh, eagles. No, that's kind of American iconography. Well, you, you see what I'm getting at here, right? Like, this is the sort of how you want to flesh out your factions. Uh, and let's do the loyalists. The loyalists believe in, uh... Rule of law. The good of institutions. So the anarchs are fundamentally against in institutions. The loyalists are like, no, we need them because they're good and they make our laws for us. Uh, Evan Ross is obviously their leader. Evan Ross. Camilla Defector. Uh, he's definitely still the brains behind the operation. I don't know. Maybe there's like... Someone, or maybe the face, like, they don't know that the face is connected to Evan Ross. Uh, let's say, uh, Skyball. That's a cool name. I'm just using names from Random Name Generator right now. Skyball. Sorry about that. Uh, she's a businesswoman, uh, who, uh, works for Ross. She's not really, like... She's like all subtly. Oh, maybe she's like a news anchor, business woman. So she she's basically kind of like slowly inserting Ross's ideas into people, and f actually, I like the, not a business woman. I like the idea that she's a news anchor and a firebrand. Oh, I love the maybe she's a bruja. I like the idea that of like bruja who are really loyal to the Camarilla. Uh, I think that's cool, because she's like, you know, these people, they're basically, like, sh trying to shoot down the Anarchs. And what better person to do that than a Bruja? And the last member, uh, let's say, uh, hmm, I want to say, uh, Tremere. Uh, let's tie it into something of the Lord, the circulatory system, which is the, uh, what's your name? I'm just going to go with Hecate, because I think it's cool. Because more, more vampire characters need to be mononymous. Business, she is a businesswoman with ties to the circulatory system, which is a cool little lore thing. Basically, uh, all you need to know about her is that 
She has a vested interest in keeping the trade routes that Evan Ross runs open. Uh, she's not really here for any more reason. Uh, modus operandi. Uh, getting people mad. R smuggling. Lots of smuggling. Big businesses. I think that maybe a lot of... Oh, maybe they're bringing in, like... Oh, <laughs> oh it's just like Stardew Valley where, like... Uh, the Anarchs kind of support local businesses. Uh, and so Ross is like, you know what? Let's bring in, like, Target or stuff to run them out of town. Oh, that'd be really cool. So they support big businesses, that sort of thing. Uh, schisms. Hmm. What about people who are like, yeah, we need to be more open to outsiders, but we also, we don't really like the Camarilla. All right, so we have Anarchs who are just like, yeah, we don't like the current system, but we don't need to get the Camarilla involved. Uh, and maybe business people with no real moral interest. So kind of like Hecate, like, yeah, you're helping open trade routes, so I'll help you out. But, you know, we're business partners. We're not like brothers in arms or anything. I think that's a very cool thing. Kind of put them on the camera if you think about it. Uh, hmm. What would sort of epitomize the loyalists? Uh, city slickers, nice suits, and uh, just like cars and stuff. Uh, what if they're like uh, mobsters? <laughs> or kind of have that sort of mobster aesthetic about them. I think that's really cool. So those are how we do our factions. Uh, and already we have a bunch of characters that we could add to the relationship map. And that's actually what we're going to focus on next episode. Uh, kind of designing your characters, making them very fleshed out. I'm not going to go over character sheets. I'm just going to look at giving characters personality, making them people. Uh, so thank you all so much for watching. I hope you really enjoyed this video. I'm uh, really happy to finally be making this series uh, and sharing my knowledge with the world. If you liked this video, don't forget there is a button for that. Please be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content from me. Uh, if you want to support my videos in a monetary fashion, go to patreon.com slash lilythedoof. Uh, for just one dollar, you can get access to my Discord and vote on what videos I do. Uh, and there's even cooler rewards as you go up. But of course, none of that's necessary. Just liking videos, commenting on them, sharing them with your friends, all help me wonderfully. As always, my name is Aura. Trans rights.